Listen for the words of God. First Kings chapter nineteen, verse one to eighteen. When Ahab got home, he told Rezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Rezebel sent this message to Elijah: May the gods strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servants there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord," he said. "Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors, who have already died." Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, "Get out and eat." He looked around. And there, beside his head, was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate, and drank, and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, "Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you." So he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel forty days and forty nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave, where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, "What are you doing here, Elijah?" Elijah replied, "I have jealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars." And killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a whisper, gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, "I have jealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too." Then the Lord told him, "Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus." When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be son, a king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shapa, from the town of Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve seven thousand others in Israel, who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled "Change, Change, Change," which is delivered by Reverend Peter Chen. Ah,、uh, for reading God's word to us. It's very nice to be back here to preach at EM. It's been a long time.、Uh, the last time I preached here, I believe, was in July 2013. So at least two and a half years, almost three years.、Um, so I'm very glad to be back, especially as we are, I believe, wrong wrong way. It's been a while. It's 
been a while. Uh, we're celebrating EM, the English ministry, all of you, all of us together. We're celebrating EM's 10th anniversary. So it's been 10 years since 2006. That's when it began. Um, I have a lot to share with you. Okay, it's good to see new faces, old faces. The old faces, um, you've known me for a while. You know I can uh, talk for a while. Uh, but for most of us, we endure me. Uh, for 10th anniversary, though, I wanted to share 10 different things that could help us to grow in our faith, 10 different changes. Um, because EM is 10 years old, 10 changes. Um, initially, I offered to speak at the Taiwanese service because uh, they're celebrating the 103 third year. Uh, but Elder Su said no, because I wanted to share 103 changes. He thought it was a bit too long. Um, so he told me, why don't you go to EM? Just share 10. Okay. Uh. Um, so again, I'm very happy to he be here. Let's get right to God's word. It is a good word for us. There you go. Okay, we'll start with a little bit of background. Today's scripture, it talks about Elijah. He's running away from something. Specifically, he's running away from someone. Elijah is a faithful prophet of God. He speaks for God. He speaks on behalf of God, especially to God's people, especially when God's people are not listening, okay? when they are bukwai, you know, bukwai. That's when God needs to talk to them about what they're doing wrong and how they can turn around and start doing what's right. So that's the job and the burden and responsibility that Elijah had as God's prophet. Uh, we didn't read this, but the previous chapter, it talks about how Elijah proved that God is the real God and that all the other gods, they're, they're false. Okay. He made it obvious, everyone should know, they should be able to see that we're worshiping the wrong gods, not those, we need to worship this one true God. And yet, what was the result? No one really listened. And in fact, Jezebel, the queen, decided instead of turning around, repenting and worshiping the one true God, she said, I'm going to kill him. Yeah, I don't like him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill that Elijah. And so, you know, put yourself in Elijah's shoes. If someone is trying to kill you, wouldn't you run away? Wouldn't you run and try to hide from being caught so that you don't get killed? I think all of us would be doing the same thing. Um, so it's during this period where Elijah is going through a lot of troubles that we have some things that we can learn, some things that can help us to continue to be faithful, even as Elijah in his troubles was trying to be faithful to God. Um, before we continue, let us go into a prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you are always speaking to us. We thank you for Bible characters such as Elijah that through their faithfulness we can still learn today in 2016 how we may also be faithful to you. Lord, we thank you for this church. We know that you've done so much through Swanglian Church and that you have so much more that you want to do through Swanglian Church. And so every single week we come, we gather that we may be your people, learning to be a faithful people, not just on Sunday, but also every day of the week, every day of our lives. We just ask that you may bless these words that flow out of my mouth, that you may touch our hearts, our minds, and help us to keep on growing as your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so a few changes, 10 changes. The first change is change the way that you talk to God. Okay, when we heard the passage, heard that Elijah was talking to God in a very simple and very natural way. In verse four, he pours out his troubles to God. He lays it out. He goes to God and he doesn't say it this way. Okay, he doesn't go to God and say, oh, almighty God, creator of all life, and sustainer of all life. He doesn't do it like that. All of that is true. That is who God is. But he doesn't come to God in those ways. Instead, he's 
I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. In other words, Elijah is saying, Lord, I've been faithful serving you year after year after year. Your people are not listening. All that we've done is nothing good is coming from that. Your people are not turning around. They've turned a deaf ear to you, and I'm tired. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do it anymore. I can't go on anymore. It really is too much for me. That's how Elijah was talking to God. So my question to you is, how do you talk to God? How do you talk to God? Now, for the title of this section, I call that chapter, or change number one, talk to God. It's very much the same as pray to God, except I purposely didn't want to use the word pray because for most of us, we have this notion of how prayer should be. We have this notion that prayer should be more formal. But I don't think so. Because when we see it in the Bible, all these faithful prophets and even Jesus himself, they don't get all formal, especially not in their direct one-on-one -one -on -one kind of prayers. So I think your prayer, my prayer, is good when we keep it as simple and as natural as we can. Talk to God about your real thoughts, about your real feelings. And here's the reason why. God is real, and he wants you to be real to him. If God is supposed to be our heavenly father, as Jesus teaches us in the New Testament, then when we talk to God, or when we talk to our heavenly father, shouldn't it be like, we're talking to a family member, someone who's close, rather than someone who's so far away. Can you imagine how hilarious it might be if my children, three years old and four and a half years old, if they wanted to play with their toys, they come to me and they say, oh, tall and strong, and wealthy king of the household. I'm the king because one of them is a prince and the other is a princess, right? Most handsome, most generous of all kings. May we play with our toys. No, don't do that. I mean, I'm going to say yes, but I don't want them to say it in such a way. Come on, we're family. I'm your dad. You're my kids. No formalities, please. All you got to do, and this is what they do, they come to me and they say, Daddy, can we play with our toys? And I say, sure, go ahead. Go play with your toys. Okay. As you pray to God, your heavenly father. Come to him and talk to him as simply and as naturally as you can. There's one more thing I do want to point out. If you notice in verse 9, um, God says to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, what's going on? What's the matter? What's troubling you? Okay, tell me, tell me what's going on. Are you okay? And in verse 10, Elijah responds by saying, I'm discouraged, I'm scared, I don't want to do this anymore. To which God says, um, and you'll have to use your imagination because I was using my imagination. God says, <clears throat> Elijah, can you hold? Hold on a minute. Okay, I know this long distance phone call, long distance communication with each other, you know, it's getting to you, right? You're, you're feeling discouraged. I see that. I sense that. I hear that. But hold on a minute, just a moment, because I'm going to come to you, and we'll continue our talk in person, okay? And so the Lord says to Elijah in verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain. Okay, God is coming. Go out and stand before me 
in the mountain. I will arrive shortly. And that's when we hear about the wind, the powerful wind that comes and it tears up the mountain so that rocks fall from it. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then comes this fire and this earthquake, although I think the earthquake came first and then the fire came. But the same thing we hear. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. God was not here yet until finally a gentle whisper. A whisper. And you know what? God has arrived in a whisper. This point, to me, it touched me. It was very important. Okay, so I want to show you a little something. Um, AVT, I'm turning off my microphone, so it's not broken. There's Oh, in the back, can you hear me? Could you hear me? Could you hear what I was saying to Joanne? She heard it. Did you, people in the middle, did you hear what I was saying to Joanne? Did you hear? You're right behind her. Can <laughs> okay. Why didn't you hear me and why did Joanne hear me? Because I was whispering. And that means you can only hear me if you're close enough to me. So can you imagine just how close God was to Elijah? So when we pray with formalities, it's, it's as if we expect God to show up in a powerful wind, a powerful earthquake, a powerful fire, that when those things come, I mean, how close do you want to get to a fire? How close do you want to get to an earthquake? Do you want to be in the earthquake? Absolutely not. We don't want to get close to these things. But when God comes in a whisper, what does that tell us? God wants to be really close. Okay. When we talk to God, let's not pretend or let's not make it as if God is sitting in the back of the room, as if we have to shout for God to hear us. Whisper when you talk to God. God will hear you. It tells us with this powerful contrast, um, those powerful things, and then this, not just a whisper, this gentle whisper, such a great contrast, but it shows us that God is not only powerful, he is, but there's also another part of him that sometimes we forget. God is very gentle. God is very personal. God wants to be intimate with us. He shows up to us in a whisper because God does not want to be far from us. He wants to be near to us. Okay? So I ask the question again, same question. How do you talk to God in your lives? If you're not already doing so, I would recommend that you talk to God anytime, all the time. Do it as simply, as naturally as you can. And that means, you know, sometimes when you feel like crying to God, cry to God. When you're happy, you feel like laughing with God, laugh with God. Ask him questions. I know you have questions. We all have questions. I have so many questions 
I wonder if God ever gets fed up with me, and I know God doesn't because he likes my questions. God, how do I become a good parent? I'm still learning. God is still teaching me. Some of us were wondering, what do I do with my parents who are perhaps aging? How do I show my love to them and still provide for both families? Many of us were working. Lord, you know, should I quit this job? When I was here for seven years, everyone was asking me, Pastor Peter, should I quit my job? I said, I don't know. Ask God. Some of us were thinking, should I you know, get a new job? Should I take this job offer? I asked questions, things like, Lord, I need a bicycle. A few of you in there know, I need a car. Okay, I've been looking for a new car to replace my 20-year-old car. But even that 20-year-old car we bought last year, it was the result of my talking to God. Right? So God wants to know these things. He wants to know what's going on in your lives. He wants to be close to us in our lives. Change the way you talk to God. Make your prayers more personal. No formalities. Because that's the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. Ah. Go back. Go forward. Second change. <clears throat> um, change the way you enter the church. Okay? In the passage from 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 18, we've already noticed how discouraged Elijah has become. God has chosen him to be a prophet, to speak to his people, but he is just about to give up. Nothing is going right, and even when things do go right, you know, these miracles continue to happen, the people are not listening. They don't turn around, and they're not coming back to faith in God. In his struggles, there was this one thing that stood out to me, something in particular as Elijah was complaining. As he was complaining, he feels alone. He thinks and he believes, he truly believes that he's alone. He's the only person left who remains faithful to God. He says it twice. He says in verse 10, verse 14, I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. You know, God, I'm the only remaining faithful person and when I'm dead, you're not going to have anyone who is faithful anymore to you on this planet. That might have been what Elijah was thinking. Is that true? It is true in Elijah's mind. He thinks he's the only one who's left. He obviously didn't have a group of other faithful people that he could go to, he could pray with that could encourage one another. He was alone. For the most part in his career as a prophet, he was alone and he was running away from people in order to save himself. You know, people don't want to hear what God has to say. But is it really true? Is Elijah the only faithful one remaining? No, he was not. Elijah didn't know it. And up to this point, he he thought he was the only one, but God finally reveals it to him in verse 18. God says, I will preserve 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed them. Baal was one of the popular gods in Taiwan, perhaps, you know. Um, Guan Ying comes to mind and Ma Zhu. Uh, these are very popular gods. In those days, Baal was the popular god and people went to this um, god of fertility. It makes me wonder, though, how might Elijah's attitude have changed if only he had known that there were other people who were faithful to God? He didn't see them. He didn't know about them. But what if he had known that there was not one other faithful person, that there was not two other or five or ten others, that there were not hundreds of others, but actually God was preserving thousands of other faithful people. Elijah just did not know that. So when I look at the church today, it makes me wonder about this. What might it be if people in the church, and of course that means you, 
people in the church. This is a church. What if we made decisions that helps us to draw closer to each other rather than decisions that keeps us apart from each other? Right? Once a week, all of us, we come in, we fit into this room. The rest of the week, we don't see each other. We don't talk to each other. Maybe we don't want to be with each other. But what if we started to make decisions that helps us to become closer so that when we need help, just like Elijah, when he needed help and encouragement now, if we're close to each other, we can turn to each other. If we're grieving, we don't have to grieve by ourselves. But other people in the church, they will come to us and we can grieve together rather than alone. Do you think that would make us stronger? Do you think that would make the church stronger? I believe so. There is much strength in unity. Um, I'm teaching at Datong University these days, English and business English. And uh, one of the fun things is I can't stand still anymore. I used to preach from the front, and I can't go anywhere. But now that I'm teaching at school, I just feel like it's not correct to simply stand in the front. So here I am at the entrance of this church, right? the EM. Here's the door. We all come in through this door. I remember when welcome table used to be outside, but now it's right here. When we enter the church, immediately there are choices that we have to make. My first choice, or my first choice that I have to make is when I look at the room, I can turn left, go to the front. There are seats there. I could also turn right, go to the back, and there are seats there. Okay. How many of us, when we come in, we're thinking, I'm going to slip to the back? I'm going to hide in the back. I don't want anyone to see me because if it's a bad sermon, I'm leaving early. Because I have other things to do. Because, you know, after the church, there's so many people lined up for the elevator. I don't want to wait. I want to be the first to the elevator. Okay, I'm not looking to the right on purpose because I don't want to identify anyone. I'm just kidding. Uh, there are reasons why some people need to sit in the back. But what if we decided to make the better decision of, I'm going to go to the left, to the front. I'm going to sit closer to where I can receive more from God, from worship. Okay, so I make that choice. I turn to the left. And now I have another choice that I have to make because, look, there's a bunch of people here. And then, oh, there's some empty seats. Oh, I don't want to go that much farther. But there's a big hole here. There's no one there. Where should I sit? Should I sit there in the middle by myself so no one can talk to me? Or maybe do I want to go to that one empty seat and sit next to people? Let's say I decide to make the better choice as I enter the church that I'm going to sit right there. Long time no see. <laughs> Once I've seated, I still have choices that I have to make. Okay, am I going to talk to these people or am I going to pretend they don't even exist? Right? So I'll decide to talk to them. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> of course, we'll find appropriate times to talk and there will be times. But when we get to the end of the service, again, there are decisions we want to make. After the service, that's when you can actually talk to people without distracting people from worship. But do we do that? Or again, do we rush to the elevators because we want to get out of here? Right? Is that what the church is like? I want to get out of here? I don't think so. Or at least I don't think it should be because that doesn't help the church to get any stronger than it already is. Okay. So we're fortunate. We have these choices that we can make, but Elijah didn't. He was alone. He was completely alone. He couldn't go to a church. There was none. There were no faithful people gathered that he knew of where he could go and receive from each other. Encourage me. I need to be encouraged. 
We do. We have choices. Look around you. I think you just did before, but look around you. There are so many people. You don't have to connect with every single one, but you should connect with at least a few. So, change the way that you enter the church. Okay? Maybe you didn't have that choice because you're already in the church, but change the way you exit the church too. Okay, after service today, don't just rush out like you normally do. If you're not rushing to, to meet someone or if you don't have a prior appointment, linger around a little bit. Make yourself available. Get to know people. Okay? The third change. <clears throat> change the way that you number your days. Okay, in the Bible passage today, we see that Elijah has come to the end of his days. And I find it really, really interesting, and at first it was really, really confusing. There was this conversation that goes on between God and Elijah. They're talking uh, in verse 9 and 10. Okay. God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? To which Elijah answers, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 13 and 14. What are you doing here, God says. To which Elijah answers, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the, Lord, the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Same exact words. Repeat it. Why? That was confusing to me. Why does God ask the same question twice? Why does Elijah give the same answer twice? The Bible is very confusing sometimes. But I think there's a reason for that. I believe God was asking Elijah a second time because God wanted to confirm something with Elijah. What does God want to confirm with Elijah? God is asking Elijah, are you sure? Are you sure you can't go on anymore? Are you sure this is it? Are you sure you've had enough? Are you sure that you're done with this prophet kind of job? Remember earlier, Elijah had said in, in uh, verse 4, Elijah says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Elijah, are you sure you're done? Are you sure? Apparently, Elijah is sure because he repeats himself. He says the exact same thing. He makes the same decision. And so God makes arrangements for his last days. Okay, we see that towards the end of the passage, <clears throat> verse 15 through 17. Um, God says, Elijah, go anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel, and anoint Elisha to replace you as my prophet. You're sure, Elijah? Yes, I am sure you will be replaced. Our text, it ends with verse 18, but if we were to read one more verse in verse 19, it goes on to say, So Elijah went down from there, the mountain, and Elijah found Elisha, son of Shaphat. Elijah's days have come to an end. It's over. What about you? Where are you in your days? Maybe some of us were still young. Maybe some of us were still children, teenagers. And we think, we have many, many more days. We have many, many more months, years, decades in our lives. There's a lot of time still. Maybe some of us were not as young, but we think, you know, five years, ten years, that's still plenty of time. 
plenty of time to enjoy my life. But are you sure you have that many days left? See, each one of us, we have a birthday. You know exactly what month, what day, what year you were born. Maybe even what hour, what minute, what second. We look forward to that if we're still young. We look forward to our birthday to celebrate it. If we're older, we don't look forward to it and we don't want other people to know our birthdays. But you have a birthday, you know exactly when. I'm also sure each one of us, we have a death day. Each one of you is going to die, I am sure of it. And I will die too. It's fair, we get a birthday, we get a death day. Now, not very long ago, in, on February 6, 2016, there was this earthquake that came and hit Taiwan in the county of Pingdong. Magnitude of 6.7 on this other scale, um, Mercalli intensity scale, it measured 7, which means very strong. It caused a lot of damage, and all of us, most of us, we've seen on television collapsed buildings. The news just played it over and over and over again. The earthquake caused a lot of damage. It also took the lives of 117 people. Did they know that their death day was going to be February 6, 2016? Did they know that today, March 13, 2016, they won't be alive anymore? Obviously, they didn't know. Had they known that time was short, would they have changed the way that they were living in January, a month before their death day? Would it have mattered? If they had numbered their days, knowing that maybe there's not so much more days to live. I have a feeling that they might, they would change the way that they were living. Um, being reminded of that, I think because as I was preparing for this sermon, <clears throat> I lived slightly differently this week. Okay, one of my two children, I'm not going to mention the name, but uh, she <laughs> was being a little naughty. Okay, she's usually a very, very good child. But sometimes she gets a little bit naughty, especially when she's tired. And so you know, Daddy was getting angry. Okay, and Daddy was thinking, I have to punish her. You know, it's for her own good. And if I don't do it now, it'll just get worse later on. Got to teach her. Break those bad habits. Make sure she has good habits. I was thinking these things and then a thought came to my mind, or I like to think a whisper came to my ear, reminding me, but what if she might not be here next month? Would I still punish her the same way that I was thinking to punish her? Would I be as angry right then if I knew that she may not be around much longer? And that changed me. That changed the way I was thinking at the time and feeling at the time. I decided I'm going to hold her in my arms. I'm going to tell her, Daddy doesn't like what you just did, but I love you. Okay, I forgive you. And that's what I've been doing ever since. I've been hugging her and also him, my other child, and I've been reminding both of them and asking them, and did, did I tell you I love you today? No? Okay, well, I love you. Okay. If somehow we can be reminded that each one of us, we have a death day, we don't know when, when it is, but it can be as soon as today, then I believe we start to live our lives as if we're changed people. If death day is not so far away, but instead it's a little closer than we might imagine, I believe many of us, we would change the way we think and do things in our lives. There are many problems in our families, including my own. There are many problems between husband and wife, between parents and children, with in-laws, with, with friends. There are many problems in our society. 
In general, I believe our family members were getting farther and farther from each other, more and more distant. Okay. There are problems that we don't want to address. We work long hours. You know, we go to school. And after school, we go to another school. By the time we get home, everyone's tired. We don't want to spend time together. We don't want to spend quality time together. And there's this other thing about technology with tablets and smartphones, with internet and Wi-Fi. You know, it's taking the quantity out of our time. It's also taking away the quality of the time that we spend together with each other. Are you sure you want your relationships to end the way they are today? Or are you going to do something about it? If death day is today, and not far and distant, but actually very close, I think we would start changing the way that we number our days. Um, so take a moment and remind each other. Turn to someone next to you and just say, Happy death day. Okay. Happy death day. Come on, I'm serious. Okay. Um, let's hope no one will go today, but again, we never know. <coughs> One more thing about this. Did you know, have you heard about the end of the world coming this year? And it's, a, it's an idea from the Bible that the world will end one day. Just as Jesus created this world and it's beautiful, we call it home, but one day, since we messed it up, for example, global warming, Jesus will return and he will clean up this mess. Okay, Jesus will come again one day, and we call that the end of the world. But did you know that the end of the world is this year, 2016? Yeah, I see some eyes opening. Did you also know that it's not the end of this year, but it will come in June? June 6th, someone else has heard about it. June 6th, 2016, less than three months away. How are you going to live the rest of your three months here on Earth? Okay. I'm not trying to scare you, but it is nice to have you wake up. I'm a little doubtful about that myself. Um, if you want to, I don't think you need to. You know, you can go to the internet, you can search for these things. There are people who do calculations and they think June 6, 2016 is a good day, it's a good time. You know, it works out with some of the biblical prophecies. This is the right year. And look, June 6, that's 6-6, six, six, and then year 2006, 666. Six, six. So if you're familiar with things, you know, 666 six, six is the number of Satan, things like that. I'm very skeptical because whenever someone predicts that and they've done it last year and the year before that and many, many years, they're always wrong. Jesus will come back. Jesus knows exactly what day, but only Jesus knows. We don't. I'm uh, simply here to remind you that the end is probably a lot closer than we realize. And so if we don't number the way, number our days and live according to that, we are, many of us, wasting our lives, wasting our time, wasting our relationships. More importantly, as Christians, and we're not just to share our love with each other, but also to share God's love with others, especially those who don't know God yet. The good news is that for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they will not be destroyed, but they will be saved. And just like the earth will be given a rebirth, so those who believe in Jesus will also be born again to have eternal life and to live forever. So would you stop delaying and get more involved with your colleagues, with your classmates, with your teachers, with your students? Get more involved with them so that you can connect with them and have opportunities in which you can share Jesus with them. Would you stop you know, pestering your husband or your wife to become the perfect spouse? Would you stop forcing your children to choose among one of three occupations, doctor, lawyer, or engineer, and nothing else. 
find ways to love them as people whom God loves. And especially if you're a parent, find ways in which you can help your children become faithful people of God, just like Elijah, serving God to the very end of their days. Everything changes for the better when you change the way that you number your days. Um, <clears throat> three changes so far. Seven more to go. No. Obviously, I won't be able to share more things with you. There are certainly a lot of them. But let's quickly recap on what I've shared so far to today. Change the way that you talk to God. Make sure God is close to you. He is, but recognize that so you can talk to him very simply and naturally. Change the way that you enter the church. Remember, there are many, many decisions that we're making, even if we're not thinking about them, but make decisions that will help the church draw closer to each other rather than keep people at a distance. And also change the way that you number your days. Death day. We like to think that it's far, far away, but it really is not. No one knows for sure. If it's closer than it is, then how are you going to start living your life? Okay. Um, ten changes. Change the way that you talk to God. <laughs> change the way that you enter the church. Change the way that you number your days. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray.